Okay, ready? That was weak. That was a terrible, <laughs> that was a pathetic, take, take two. a pathetic clap. We are here. We are on the podcast. It is our great honor to have Steve Kerr, who is joining us, world champion with the uh, Chicago, was it the Bulls? Is that? Bulls, Bulls, yeah. The Bulls, Bulls yeah. that's correct. Yeah. And now also a world champion uh, with the Golden State Warriors and has just announced coming to the New York Knicks. It's really exciting news <laughs> that we're breaking here. Uh, I'm just going to start very quickly and say, how dare you have one bad year? Maybe two. You lose Clay Thompson. You lose Kevin Durant, and you're eleven and two. Unex is unex yeah, yeah. We're yeah, we're we're trying to trying to right the ship. Um, now we, uh, man. I, I remember I, you're talking to a Nick fan. So I, be, I know, I know. I'm trying. I'm going to be nice. You, right. you know, I, I I almost became the Knicks coach. I remember. Yeah, eight eight years ago. That's right. Phil Jackson was mm -hmm. uh, the GM, and you mm. know that was my guy and. Mm. Very intriguing, but when the Warriors come along and they've got Steph Curry mm -hmm. and Clay Thompson, Draymond, mm -hmm. it's it's kind so of. Hard. It must have been a very nice situation for you. Uh, you know, worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Steph Curry was so intriguing. Draymond Green was so intriguing that you felt that it it you had to. Yeah, but, I mean, I I talked to um, coaching friends of right. mine, and um, they all said the same thing. They said uh, your talent is everything. In coaching, and it's true. I mean, right. I remember saying, "Well, you know, Phil Jackson is my guy." And one of my good friends said, "Which job do you think Phil would take?" And I was like, "Ooh, <laughs> man!" And that kind of got me because, you know, think about it. Phil Jackson takes yeah. the Bulls job when he's got Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and his and his career takes off. Pat right. Riley takes the Laker job when he's got Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We're all dependent on our talent as right. coaches. And the Warriors were already good. You know, they were a 50-win team. They got all this young talent. Right. So I honestly, if I'd taken the next job, I would have been spun through that cycle and been gone in two years, guaranteed. Um, really? Yes. Yeah. So was it, in your mind, was it Golden State just happened to be in a prime position because they had drafted, and what was Steph, the eighth pick? The ninth Seventh, pick? I think. Seventh yeah. pick. I can't remember if the Knicks were the next pick. I think they might have been they the were. next They were the next pick, pick yeah. And uh, we picked a guy at that point. He was only 5'2", and he was a little <laughs> out of shape. Not in the league anymore, but super close. <laughs> nice guy, too. I think he's a, Very butch nice he's a butcher guy. in yeah. Brooklyn. He used yeah. to get blocked by Muggsy Bokes. <laughs> you play, obviously, on the great championship teams with Jordan. Uh, the Chicago Bulls. By the way, the year that he didn't play, the Knicks were allowed to go to the finals that year, <laughs> and we really appreciate. Seven game series with the Bulls that that year. That was uh, it, it. It was, but it was close. It was, yeah, it was tough. That was a tough loss for us. It, it was, and I felt honestly just really bad did for you? you guys. Yeah, I did. I just thought like, oh, they're so used to winning. They probably don't know what this feels yeah. like. And then I wanted to come over and be like, oh, guys, you need a hug or anything like yeah. that? Well, we're going to go and uh, we've got a, a championship to lose. You know, you saw Phil Jackson coach that team, but it was a Michael Jordan superstar team. So how much sway does a coach have in a league? Like basketball is different than any mm. other sport because it's, there's so few players. Yeah. I, I think, um, you have to walk a fine line being a coach in the NBA these days, and you you have to, and this is what Phil was really good at. This is what Greg Popovich was great at too. Right. People have to know you're in charge. The players have to feel that they have to respect that, but they have to feel that you're collaborating with them. And right. it's more so now than ever. But even back then, Phil and and MJ were collaborators. You know, Phil would lead the team with Michael and. He would empower people. He he would put his foot down when he had to. He was an amazing communicator. So there was this feeling of, all right, we're we're doing this together. And that's how I tried to coach the Warriors. It's a collaboration with Steph and Draymond, um, Andre Godala, who's back. Um, I seek his advice almost daily. Right. And uh, but you can't appear weak either. You can't appear like you don't know what you're talking about. Right. You know. So it's it's a, an interesting balance. Right. But I give them a ton of freedom because basketball, first of all, is a game of improvisation, collaborative improvisation, if that makes sense. And then mm -hmm. and then it's a game of of joy. 
I mean, and that's where I think we have really gotten it right with the Warriors. Like, there's this sense of joy with our fans, with with Steph, with our team. Mm-hmm. That if you if you get, reach this sort of uh, flow state where things are going well and their pace pace is happening and everybody's going crazy, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to watch. Um, but you got to pull back every once in a while. So you mentioned something. It was an interesting word that I hadn't heard used as a as a Nick fan. You said joy. As a Nick fan, I'm unfamiliar <laughs> with that. Yeah. So explain it again, because I it doesn't look like it looks more like I don't want to say scrum. It looks more like a scrum. Why is it in a basketball game? Because it is when you're t- when any team is in a flow and you're just you can't believe how it all felt so effortless yeah. and connected, and maybe two minutes later. It's just guys yeah. like bonking heads. Yeah, yeah. Or the next night, you can't throw it in the ocean, and you right. know, it's uh, it's a funny game that way. It's a game of of momentum. You're constantly trying to make good decisions based on the skills that you practice every day. Right. But you also don't want to impede the guys. You know, you don't want them overthinking. So it's, there's this gray area that you're, where you know, what we we call it fast, loose, and disciplined, and that's a contradiction, loose and disciplined. But that's that's the balance we're looking for. The no, worst, it makes sense. It's that idea of structure, uh, enough structure that it can be routinized and you can have expectations, but that there's room in there for oxygen and inspiration yeah, and those yeah. kinds of things. Yes, but inspiration and oxygen also require mistakes, right? Because right. You, otherwise you don't have the inspiration and the oxygen. Was it more challenging after you'd had some success or were the years where the expectation was lower mm-hmm. more challenging? Or was it the pandemic and social issues more challenging? Or does it all come into a mix for you? Yeah, I, I, I think that's the fun part of coaching, honestly, is that every season is like a new beginning and and you sense right away where your team is kind of in the hierarchy and where you are spiritually, mentally, because every year is different. And that's what makes it fun. But in the seven years that I've coached, um, undoubtedly the most fun was year one because the expectations were were low Mm -hmm. and we won the championship. And, And that sort of dichotomy was like, just amazing. And then uh, you probably felt this during your career. You you know, you do something long enough and you're on top of the mountain and it's it, it gets to be more work than than joy. It's like, an expectation. It is. It is. It, you know, it's funny. Steve Martin, he so Steve Martin, if you remember, you know, he did those uh started doing stadium shows and he did the jerk and he did all this. Yeah. And I, I remember reading in his book that he got to a point where he felt like I can't live up to the expectation or even nostalgia that mm. people have of my act, and I'll never be able to. So I'm done. Yeah, yeah. And he walked away from stand-up. Yeah, yeah. But interestingly, people in that space have gone have gone back, like Jerry Seinfeld, right? Like right. after all that success. Well, now he never. He he was always a craftsman. You know, it was funny. I don't know what the analogy to him would be in the NBA, but a guy who is just. I guess you would think of him as a gym rat, like a guy who just, just loves it. Just, just loves it. Loves yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, I've always said to him, I think you did it right, which was you created a show that was existed in a moment in time, but it had syndication rights. (laughs) I was the idiot who did a topical show. (laughs) Right, right. I got to be there for the next 30 years if we're going to stay with this thing. That's right. That's right. When you're the coach, you're of the team, but you're not the team. You know, are you considered management or one of the guys how do you toe that line, yeah. and, and especially in a league like that where it's superstars? Yeah, it's a that's a great question. Um, it's somewhere in between one of the guys and management, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, we we tried to create a culture uh, where everybody feels like they matter, not just you know on the court, but we try to celebrate people's individual achievements, but also things going on in their personal life. If they're having uh, children, if they're, you know, getting married, wh- whatever it is. I mean, so we, we, you really try to get to know your players on a, on a deeper level. Um, and again, that's something that Phil Jackson and, and Greg Popovich were the best at in, mm-hmm. in my mind. 
uh, because if you really know someone and you trust them, it's a lot easier to right. work work together through the inevitably difficult periods. It brings up an interesting point, though. So it's it's you know you look to Jackson and Popovich, two other like they're white guys. You're a white guy, like, but you're in a league now that is overwhelmingly black. Yeah. Does that divide create difficulties? And for you d- to feel like you're at a remove that you'll never be able to understand, especially during the times mm. of social unrest and after George Floyd. Yeah, I just interact with every player mm-hmm. and, and on a really personal level and connect with that player. And that's what I try to do with our guys. And and that breaks down a lot of walls for sure. Mm-hmm. But then you also have to the, have the awareness um, as a white guy in, in a, a black man's game mm-hmm. that you don't know how these guys feel in certain circumstances. And so being aware of that, like if you know, if you try to pretend like you know every, everything, mm-hmm. they'll see right through that. But if you admit to your frailties, to your different perspective that you have growing up as a white person, and you actually talk about all those things, then the, the walls start to come down. And and that's the beauty of of sports, really, is right. you know you get people from all over the world collaborating and coming together and and playing. But I will say that when the George Floyd murder happened. And the social justice march really began. That was a real reckoning for me as someone who thought I knew more than I did about black life. Right. I've played since junior high with mostly black teammates. And so my thought was always, oh, I, I think I understand, you know, black life. And then George Floyd hits and and I realize, you know, I need to I need to start reading. I need to start learning. And I spent all last year reading a ton of great books, you know, The New Jim Crow, um, you know, cast, books like that, that that are, for for white people, it's like, this is must-read stuff. Right. Because there's nuanced stuff in there that you'd you'd never think. Um, For example, the idea that a black parent has to treat his child— in a much more aggressive manner in order to protect that child from what's out there. Mm -hmm. My heart just sort of dropped thinking about that. As a father of three, like, you know, like a police car would drive by by our our house. I didn't didn't think anything of it. And then all of a sudden, when you start really looking into things and learning and reading and hearing stories, it's like, man, I, I was really ignorant. Did you address it openly? Like, did you pull everybody together and go, look, I, I may not have a sense of what's actually going on in your hearts and minds right now, but tell me what you think we should do or I should do or any of those things? We've What we've done is we've had a lot of guest speakers come in. Mm-hmm. Um, we had Tommy Smith come in, the, the sprinter, sure. who raised his fist in yeah. the 68 Olympics. We had Brian Stevenson, civil rights lawyer, just to spark conversation. Mm-hmm. A- and then... From there, you know, you start you start opening up and, and right. absolutely you share stuff like that. You know? See, it's so interesting to me because I keep thinking, you know, after George Floyd and BLM movement, so much of the white response is, boy, we've got to start, we've yeah. got to start listening and yeah. learning. But it's funny, I was watching old Dick Cabot shows and James Baldwin was on. Mm-hmm. And he was saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so I started rolling back into history a little bit and Something occurred to me, which was, oh, we've never listened. They've actually been saying yeah. the same yes. thing yes. since Frederick, Doug, since yes. all these hundreds of years back. And I'm wondering, is the racial conversation we need to have not, oh, let's learn from black people, or is it white people have to really sit yeah. down and have the conversation of why is this, why is this yeah. not sinking yeah. in? Why are we still? Yeah a resentful and resistant culture. It's not like we're learning anything new. It's been right. shouted from shouted, the hilltops shouted. Yeah. for centuries. Yeah, there's a great book about James Baldwin called Begin Again. Mm-hmm. The title explains it. You know, black people are constantly having to begin again because they've been telling us, you know, for 400 years, right. like, what's happening, but America isn't listening. Doc Rivers, during the bubble 
a uh, year and a half ago after George Floyd right. had one of the most amazing post-game press conferences. He said, we, you know, as black Americans, we love America, but America won't love us back. It's exactly what you're talking about with Dick Cavett and James Baldwin. It's, right. We've Said been talking about this forever. Right. So, so now you fast forward to critical race theory. I mean, because really, to me, all that means, all critical race theory is, is let's actually study this and let's look at real Ameri- African-American right. history and let's teach our young people about the horrors of slavery and the African-American experience. And that suddenly becomes a political tool where it's like, why would you tell your five-year-old that he's a bad person? Right. It's like, that's not what we're talking about. By right? the way, their five-year-old may be a bad person. Well, that's we don't true. Know that's that. true. <laughs> they may very well be. But that's what I'm saying. I wonder if there's a different approach which teaches, maybe goes through and questions, why has it been so hard? It seems to be white people not reckoning with what the resistance right. is. So I don't know right. if it's if there's maybe a framework around that and and maybe your experience, you know, you've you've thought about this a little bit, but what is the conversation in in white society that needs to take place absent of black people yeah. having to tutor us on yeah. the evil? Like the fact that you've got to ever sit down with somebody and go like, "Look man, I'm telling you, slavery was bad. <laughs> like it wasn't good." Yeah. yeah. But to answer your question, why can't white people have this conversation? Mm-hmm. I think it's it's really difficult to look at the horrors of the past and admit to them. And uh, for for the vast majority of people, there's a guilt. Right. I think there's a a horror at what we've done. Is there or is there resentment of having to talk about it if you didn't think it was you? This sense of come on. You know, you, we gave you yeah. the right to vote. I'm not right. enslaving you. Right, right. Where yeah. does that? Where do you think I'm that? I'm just res- trying to. Right. I'm just trying to raise my family. That's right. Yeah. I don't have yeah. privilege. I'm yeah. poor too. Yeah. Which, yeah. B- by the way, people's lives are hard. Well, it's like Mitch McConnell uh, about a year ago was asked about reparations, mm-hmm. and he and he said, "Well, we're not responsible for what happened." You know, right? Three hundred years ago, four hundred years ago. Right. What we are responsible for is what's here and now, and mm-hmm. as you said. Structural racism exists everywhere, and so it's much harder for a black person to make the same leap as a white person in any profession, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll have white friends ask me, they'll say, well, what about Obama became president, you know, or what about LeBron James being the most popular athlete? It's like, yes, but do you realize how exceptional those people had to be to rise through this structure that we have put in place over the last few hundred years that subdues that sort of rise. And and so, yeah. whereas for wh- white people, we're like, there's a lot of people out there who are wildly successful who aren't really that impressive. <laughs> <laughs> are you saying there's been a rise of mediocrity in the white community? That's uh, it's shocking. I almost think the trauma is deeper because imagine for somebody like LeBron James, as much success as he's had, as hard as he works, somebody still wrote the N-word on his gate yeah. in Los yeah. Angeles. It feels like for the black community, there has to be a kind of dealing with the trauma, right? But in the white community, I almost wonder where the resentment and resistance is from. And I almost wonder if it's resource guarding. And there's this sense that these resources are being given to those people, even though I didn't have anything to do with it. Right. And that's being taken away from me. That's 100% out there. And it's being exploited politically. That's the, that's the, the biggest problem. Right. It's being used as a political tool for power, this, this idea of, of resentment. And I mean, that's not a new take, uh, right. obviously, but it's directly uh, related to racism and why things uh, remain the way they are. Do you think there is a positive change Uh, that's going to occur. Because to my mind, it feels like we're regressing. Mm -hmm. And in your travels and and, and talking to people, is there optimism or are you feeling a certain resignation from people? No, I think there's optimism. There's a lot of great work being done in the grassroots. You Mm -hmm. know, one of the things the NBA Coaches Association did was every coach and team connected with a local 
grassroots uh, community service organization that's dealing with African-American life. Mm -hmm. People are doing amazing stuff out there. So from that perspective, there's a lot of hope. And there's also a lot of uh, corporate help. Where the the hope starts to fade is in what you just talked about. You know, the the politics sort of drive a lot of uh, where we're heading, you would think. And the, the politics are so intertwined with this exact dynamic you're talking about. And, and it just feels like we can't get anywhere politically, even though there's all these people on the ground who are doing great work and so many wonderful people who are who, who care and who are right. passionate about uh, creating a more equitable country. Is part of the problem that people don't have enough experience with those that they would consider others? Yes. And is that, you yes. know... Right. That's that's what Brian Stevenson talked to our team about. He said people need proximity. Mm -hmm. They need they need to actually get to know someone who is going through the pain of whatever societal ills are reaching them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 great to write a check. It's great to, you know, send money to a charity whatever. But when you actually connect with a human being, mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's powerful. I went uh, Steph and Clay and I went uh, about a year and a half ago to Oakland to a gun violence prevention program that's in place there. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most amazing uh, nights of, of our lives. We were all pretty much in tears at the end of it. But this, this group, it's a group called Live Free in Oakland. Uh, Pastor Mike McBride runs this gun violence prevention program. What they're doing is they're getting everybody who's involved in local gun violence. So you've, you know, the police, gang members, social workers, mentors, the mayor, uh, you get you get all these people to sit around a table mm -hmm. once a month, and everybody gets to talk. And so we're sitting there, Steph and Clay and I are sitting there, and we're hearing from first from the the young men who were involved in gang violence and gun violence. Mm -hmm. We're hearing their personal stories. This is why I'm in a gang. This is why. I committed this act. I was wrong, but this is what my life is like. Mm -hmm. And you hear from the policeman. The policeman says, well, in the past, we were rewarded for the number of arrests we've made. The social workers talk about the mentoring process. There's a mentor over here, right? And so the, the collaboration in this group is so beautiful to watch. And it's literally, it's touching every single aspect of the people involved. And by the end of the night, you you care about every single person in that room and there's a humanity to it. And it's like, okay, now we can get somewhere. Is there a way to scale that up or make those solutions global? Or do we need midnight basketball for white resentment? <laughs> you know what I mean? Get, get like, get like white people right. to come uh, in and, and, uh, and play and be like, just call it like you mad bro. Right. And just like everybody plays and be like, don't be mad. Be, it's, it's nobody. You, you weren't going to get into that school anyway. Just relax. Oh, right. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. You know, there's there's so much to this, and you have right. to start somewhere. And and you think about all the different organizations that are out there that are trying to help. Um, when groups can start to collaborate with city government, and and you actually start making progress um, in a large group, then you see you know a real impact made. But no question, it's a huge challenge. How much is ownership a part of connecting with these? Issues. Every NBA organization has a, uh, a community uh, foundation that's raising a ton of money and trying to uh, connect in the community. I think there's a focus now, an, an awareness mm -hmm. from, from franchises that we've got to connect um, with our own city. Having said that, um, beyond that, it, you know, every individual owner has his own agenda, his own right. charities, his own political beliefs and and so there's always kind of a balance in there somewhere. And the big controversy in basketball now is, sure, everybody will speak about uh, the injustices of America and race, but nobody will talk about China mm -hmm. because that's where their money is. Mm -hmm. And how real is that? Yeah. And and how much is that calculation, a capitalist calculation? Sure. You know, on the right, there's a sense, if LeBron speaks up, shut up and dribble, yeah. right? Yeah. Have players not speak up about American injustice. In, in other words, what they're mm. saying is, unless you're going to speak equally right, about right. every injustice, yeah. then we're not yeah. going to listen to you about this injustice. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder if it's cynical. I think so. I, I got embroiled in this two years ago. Yeah. And, and at this point, you know, when we would come to our pregame media, um, we were being asked about 
every aspect of political life. Oh, I'm sure. You know, <laughs> there was no, there was nothing about pick and roll coverage. It was all about, you know, <laughs> what do you think about the latest in China? And uh, and it yes. was probably my low point as a coach in terms of my response. I'm I was kind of ashamed of my response. Oh, really? Yeah, because I didn't take a, a, a stand. And, right. You know, and, and so people rightly criticize me. And actually, President Trump, uh, criticized me in his did he really yeah, personally? yeah the next day oh that's yeah. so not like you, him no I was so shocked yeah generally yes. just <laughs> kind I believe that he's the Johnny Appleseed of yes, kind words that's right that's yeah. right uh, but what a weird experience for me you yeah know? was it a social media frenzy were you canceled is that was that the kind of feeling that it was yeah so I, I wasn't engaged with that issue on social media but I had engaged in a lot of other. Uh, political and social issues and social media, re retweeting articles or, or things that I saw that I believed in. I've been really open about gun violence in, in right. America, and I've made a lot of enemies on on, on that issue. Um, right. And so I've Although been, for clarification, your family suffered yes, devastating loss. Yeah. Your, your father was Yeah. My dad was uh, was killed uh, in Lebanon as it was a political assassination right. uh, in 1984. And, and so my family and I have all been really passionate about gun safety and trying to make a push for smarter gun laws in this right. country. But, you know, when I started speaking out on it, um, you know, I became that guy. And so then people would ask me about other, other stuff. So when they came and asked me about China, I was totally unprepared. I gave a terrible answer right. and it was embarrassing. And it was a good reminder that you talk about stuff publicly, you got to be prepared for everything that's coming your way. Certainly basketball, the coaches, I mean, are much more outspoken when it comes to yeah. social issues, much more comfortable yeah. talking about the media than any other sport that I've ever seen. It's not as tenuous or dangerous a place for a coach to speak out. We talk everything out as a team, and we've got guys who are really outspoken. I mean, Draymond Green's got an opinion on I've not on noticed it, that about everything. Draymond. <laughs> I did the, pay, I did the shop with, with him and uh, and LeBron and all that, and by yeah. the end of it, I was like, Draymond, I'm sorry, I don't know. You know exactly. He, yeah. No, we, we encourage our guys to be really um, frank and, and open and outspoken mm -hmm. if that's what they want, or if they don't you know, feel comfortable. And we try to provide resources. I mean, it, it's a tricky one. I'd always felt that social media had a, almost a physical weight, mm. you know, and we were part of that ecosystem. The yeah. Daily Show, you know, so much of media is incentivized for the most conflict, something out of con. They're looking for the nugget that's going to create right. the largest blast radius, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So we made a show every day, but it wasn't so much, Twitter wasn't really a thing at that point or it was just starting. Now, boy, when I came back, I was surprised at the ferocity of it, yeah. the ubiquity of it, yeah. and and how much like you really do realize, oh, I, I can't really engage in That's this right. if That's right. I want to maintain that internal barometer yes. of, of moral direction that yep. I think I have. Yep. Yeah, I quit. I quit Twitter in March and it's been blissful. Has it really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's... That's good because I've been adding you and uh, no response. Yeah. A little, yeah. Well, a little disappointing. That, I, no, I, I saw your... I but saw, do the I guys get... I mean, this is a... You know, they're playing a game and if they miss a three-pointer yeah. at the buzzer, yes. my guess is, boy, they're going to get hit with vitriol in a way that is appalling. No, Danny, Danny Green was playing for the Lakers in the bubble finals against Miami. Mm -hmm. Missed a potential game-winning shot, series winning shot, I think like in game five, mm -hmm. got death threats on social media, death threats that day, and then was interviewed about it the next day right. um, and had, you know, and then has to answer all those questions and then go back out and play. And it's never been harder to be a professional athlete than it is right now. These guys have their phones at their fingertips. They've got criticism and judgment coming their way every single minute. And it's hard to put that down, especially when you've been raised with it. Right. I do know that when I walk in at halftime of every game, every guy's on his phone. At halftime? At halftime, yeah. No! Yes, yes. Wait, really? Yeah, yeah. So when do they have the orange slices? You still do orange slices, Yes, right? orange slices. Gotta yes. have orange slices. Pretzel, pretzel sticks. That's right. Yes. Gotta have a little yes. bit of orange slice, a little pretzel yeah. stick, a little bit of water. And your phone. As soon as I walk in, generally, you know, they— 
They put the phones down. And, Couple minutes. And this is, I've talked to my fellow coaches, it's league-wide. It's, and, and by the way, in 2021, if you tried to be the coach, like, no phones in the locker room. On game night, you, you're you're not going to stick done. around. Yeah, you're done. You don't you don't even bother going down that path. So you you try to use humor. You know you right. Yeah, you know, walk in and hey, anybody say anything good about my coaching on Twitter? First half. That's uh, nice. yeah. You know, or hey, what's uh, did is your girlfriend happy with your perf? You know, you know, oh and and then they just kind of laugh God. and you put the phone down and you know it's just. Um, Have you tried tweeting out halftime instructions so nope. that maybe when they're on the phone, I that's think good. that's good. Don't you think that'd be really awesome? Good. All right, final question. How far away are the Knicks? And let's just go two time horizons. <laughs> My lifespan. Yeah. And the Knicks getting past, let's say, the second round yeah. of the playoffs. I'm 58. So if I hang in there, start yeah. juicing, and if I know the Knicks are good, I will hang on. Yeah, for longer. Will I be on, let's say, dialysis, or <laughs> like, where will I be in before the Knicks, in your mind, are yeah. in that position? You know, we were just talking about Twitter. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if I answer this question, yes, there's a decent chance yes. a lot of people are going to be tweeting about on it. Twitter. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. And and it generally might, positive things might be a little embarrassing <laughs> for me. <laughs> So, yeah. Would Steph ever be bored of this <laughs> winning that you're doing and think to himself, why don't why doesn't a superstar think to himself, I'm going to take this 50-year terrible burden that's been on the Nick fans and I'm going to carry them to the promised land. Why wouldn't what about you and Steph? Okay, let's <laughs> listen to this. What if you and Steph there's got to be some sort of avatar, tiki, something that if you touch it and Steph touches it at the same time I and Spike Lee touch it, surely yeah. we can infuse. But mainly Steph. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mainly okay. Steph. Okay. All right, fair enough. If it's going to take magic, it's probably not <laughs> worth it. Uh, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. And talking to us. Fantastic, yeah. sir. Thank you. It really I is, enjoyed it. Really you know, enjoyed it. It, it, it really is a minefield, and I admire it, but it is like, you know, I look at the structure. I was talking to Keyshawn Johnson uh, a while back, and I was saying, you know, football, Vic Fangio, I guess, was the a coach. Of the, he's the head coach Broncos. of the Denver Broncos. Yeah. And during this time, he was saying, you know, the locker room's a meritocracy, and I look out there and I see, you know, people are in here because— their talent demands it, and they win their positions. And I was like, yeah, I, I don't think they're talking about the locker room. Turn around at the owner's box. Like, yeah. That's where the structural part yeah, is. Yeah, that's right. But that's it's right. so hard to permeate. Yeah, yeah. He was saying that he didn't think that black ownership had the kind of resources that you could buy into an NBA franchise. Because I really think, I think the fight for equality doesn't happen until the fight for equity is more even. Mm-hmm. That's mm -hmm. always been my position because otherwise it's too unbalanced a negotiation. I guess this is kind of kind of my point about how a person, a black person, has to be so exceptional right. to rise, right? To permeate so, that, yeah. Yeah, to permeate. So, and so think of that at the corporate level. You know, the world is dominated by white men, right? Right. So I don't know the answer, yeah, but changing um, those tributaries of the top. I don't know how many billionaires there are in the country. Now there's probably hundreds, but right. but of the 20 richest Americans, right. how many How many black people, right. men or women? Yeah, and how do you change that? It'd be funny, even in this, a smaller way, here in television, right? So television, even 10 years ago, was not, even if you look around now and you go like, oh, there's a pretty diverse workplace. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, not even close to this. And a lot of it was, you didn't realize the internships weren't paid. So if you weren't already ahead mm. in life, in other words, if your parents weren't right, ahead, right, you couldn't get an internship. You couldn't afford yeah. to take a job wow. for no money yeah. and live in the city. Yeah. And then when the show was hiring, who would they choose from? The interns. Yeah, the interns, right. So it perpetuated. Yep. Yep. And until you started paying the interns and changing the tributaries, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's- Think you, how many ways that is manifested. Oh. Right, Think societally. about financial institutions right. who they hire from certain colleges. And then those colleges, though, are feeders, and they yeah. don't look in other places. And that's 
two examples of yeah, thousands of, myriad. of yeah. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy, man. Really uh, fun. I'm going to give you my email or my phone number that way if you ever great want to chat, talk, yeah, thank you. get a little snack and, uh, when you're in town. Do we have a pen and paper? Or is, yeah, I think we got it's, one. Are you coming? Yeah. We do.